Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Sherrard Show. I am your host, Sherrard. I hope you're having a wonderful Saturday evening. Today and tonight, we have a very special show. I'm so excited to have this beautiful young lady on the show. She is a publicist as well as an author, and she's written a book. And this book um, is so fascinating, the title alone. It's called Trapped in a Little Girl's Body. And she's going to be talking about some experiences that may be a little bit sensitive to um, younger audiences, so definitely viewer and listeners at discretion is advised. But this is her autobiography um, about being a publicist and a concert promoter and some of the things she's experienced. Welcome to the show, Daily. How are you? I am blessed and highly favored. My two words. Amen. So good to hear from you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the Sherrard Show is brought to you by Essence Television. Um, this episode is going to be broadcasting on iHeartRadio, but you also will be able to see it on my network, Essence Television. Just add it to your Roku, and you'll be able to see this episode. And if you miss it on Essence Television, you can always listen to it on iHeartRadio. Just type in uh, the Sherrard Show, and you'll see it um, right there. Now, um, Doreen, first of all, um, my prayers are with you. Um, I know you haven't been feeling the best, but how are you feeling tonight? Uh, I'm feeling pretty good. Just taking it one day at a time. I'm that's very positive, to though. Very positive. Yeah, and I see, man, that's the way to be. Now, you wrote mm-hmm. a book, and this book is available on Amazon. It's, it's available wherever fine books are sold. And it's called Trapped in a Little Girl's Body. It's a true story of abuse, molestation, forgiveness, and triumph. And that's all for today's topic called Forgiving Others is the Greatest Gift You Can Give to Yourself. So tell us a little bit about your inspiration of writing this big book, Mrs. Edwards. Uh, well, you know, I was sitting around. Uh, I went out to dinner with uh, Tia and Tamara, mom, if you're familiar with them. And mm-hmm. uh, she she was taking me out to dinner. And we was talking, and she said, was telling me about her life. And I said, you need to write a book about your life, how she met Tia and Tamara's dad. They was in the fifth or sixth grade, some. But anyway, um, and they're you know different racial, you know, her she had the Caucasian problem, and and so so she said she was gonna write more, and I said, well, you know, I need to write one about me, and I kind of shared a little bit about me, and she said, um, that would be nice, you should do it. So I said, okay, let me think about it, and then I started writing it. My sister, that's her dad, didn't want me to write it. No disrespect, you know, because no one wants you to talk about your dad, number one. Mm-hmm. But she didn't want me to write it, so I started writing it, and then I stopped writing it because I love my family. But then I have a, a friend of mine, she called me about 5 in the morning, and she said, Dorian, the Lord told me to tell you to write this book. And I've already paid the publishers and everything for the book. So I, she said, they're sending a contract in the mail. And she said, now you can have a blessed night. And she hung up. And then I said, oh, man, I wasn't going to even write it. But then I said, I can't turn this woman down and she's paying for this book. So the contract came. And I looked at it and I said, you know what, I'm, I got to, I have to do it now. So what made me really, really do it is is my other sister. I was sharing with her that my sister didn't want me to write it. And she said, well, go ahead on and write the book, sis, because when you left, he started molesting me. But mm-hmm. I got a little upset behind that. Mm-hmm. And I said, you know, I'm really going to write this book now. So that's, that's what inspired me to really write it. So, so in this book, you're stating that your dad was the one that molested you? Stepfather. Your stepfather, okay. Now, what age Correct. was it that when it, when the molestation started? How old were you? I was seven years old. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I was seven, and the minute it happened, you know, a lot of people say pe- kids don't tell, but they do. I went to my mom, and I told my mom that he touched me in the wrong place. She told me the point, and I did. And she said, I need to have a talk with him in the morning. Mm -hmm. So the next day she told me she talked to him, and he told her that wasn't true. I probably was having nightmares. Mm -hmm. Uh, Apparently she believed in him, 
because, you know, he he still was there. But anyway, I didn't understand because I was looking at her as my hero, and therefore prayer was supposed to, supposed to protect you, you know. Mm-hmm. Sorry about that. Uh, no, I'm one of them. got to come fix it. Yeah, so anyway, um, I I just, you know, I, I'm i trying to, where was I at? So that, not, well, you were speaking about... On. You were speaking about that your your um apparently your mother did not believe you because he was still oh, there. Oh, hero. Mhm. Yeah, so I was looking for her to really say something because it, you know as a parent they normally go off. You know when you say something wrong, but apparently she said he said he was. It never happened, so apparently she believed in him. So mm-hmm. after that, I I did feel bad. I feel very sad about it. Because I thought she was going to do something. But, mm-hmm. so, um, by her not doing anything, uh, I just used to just cry. I should have named the book The Closet because that was my comfort zone. I would go in there all the time and mm-hmm. pray. I did that for 18 years. Mm-hmm. You know, and, um, but, but now and after... I would go in the closet. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But now, after after um, you reported it to your mom and she didn't do anything about it, how did your stepfather t- treat you after that? I mean, he still treated me the same, but he only mm-hmm. done this now when he was drinking. Mm-hmm. When mm-hmm. he wasn't drinking, he was the minister father, go to church, mm-hmm. you know, and then when he didn't, so when he take a drink or whatever, he's covering him in that room. Mm-hmm. So, so now that was that happened at seven years old. Now, going from there, um, you speak about abuse as well. Now, was he the same one that abused you as well? My mom. Your your stepfather. Oh, yeah, he, he yeah he 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 was the one I'm saying that was abused. You know, no, no, what I'm saying. You, 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 yeah, you were speaking about the molestation, but was he abusing you in terms of like? you know, giving you vicious beatings and things like that as well? Yeah, he was the main one. He would always come in my room. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, at that time, she wasn't in there, my sister. And then as we got older, then she became, you know, when you you got a lot of kids, my mom had eight, uh, Mm -hmm. two sisters or three sisters sleep in the same room. And Mm -hmm. you got these beds. Well, it was like that with us. Four girls, mm-hmm. four boys, and four girls. So, oh wow! Uh, and she got older, you know. She started uh, sleeping in the same room where I was. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, did now did this happen to the other siblings as well, or is that something that just happened to you? Well, that's what I was saying. What made me really write the book is when I told the second sister, which was his daughter too, and I mm-hmm. and I said my sister, I said. Well, you know, she don't want me to write this book. And she said, sis, now this is the same sis father, you know. She said, sis, go ahead and write the book because when you left, he started molesting me. Oh, wow. Like oh, wow. the other sister. So that, that's what made me mad and really made me want to write the book. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so I started um, back right. <laughs> So now, um, what was the mother's response when the other sibling, your sister, reported the same thing that you had reported? She didn't respond, I don't think. Mm -hmm. I don't think she responded at all. So so growing up, you know, you at seven, by the time you reached 13, what was your perspective and outlook on life? And the reason why I'm asking that is because a lot of times, you know, victims of molestation turn around and be molesters themselves. They do, you know, and I believe and, that's what happened to my stepfather. Is somebody had to hurt him in order for him to come back and start doing kids like that, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Something happened in his life. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But now, um, how did that? How did it affect you with when you got to the age of dating and your your outlook on men? How did that affect you? I I didn't have no problem dating. The, the good point, I didn't, you know, I'm not saying it to offend anyone. I didn't turn gay or nothing. 
Because some people mm-hmm. end up being gay behind all that stuff. Or they right. I turn drug addicts. So neither one mm-hmm. that I was blessed not to. I, stay, I prayed a lot. And, and mm-hmm. none of that, uh, thank God that it didn't flex on me to to do those type of things. I, I, I went to church a lot and I prayed a lot. And I just mm-hmm. thank God. Those that don't believe in God may say that's not true. But I thank God for his prayers and you know, and helping me to to deal with all this. Right, right. Now, um, again, for those who just tuned in, we are speaking to uh, Doreen um, or Doreen uh, Edwards. She is a publicist. She's also an author, and her book that she had written was uh, being tra- trapped in a little girl's body: a true story of abuse, molestation, forgiveness, and triumph. Now, let's talk about the title for a minute, uh, Mrs. Edwards. Now, um. When you're trapped in a little girl's body, as you mentioned, what does it mean? Does it feel like you you have some past and things in the past that just won't allow you to shape and grow up? Now, before you answer, um, me, we'll let you get the alarm. Uh, I, well, you know, I, only reason why I named it, and the people always ask me about trapped in a little girl's body, but the only reason why I, I did do that is because of uh, uh, I thought about uh, I asked God to give me a title, and like I said, I was gonna name the club. I didn't name it anyway. Uh, the only reason I, this has been a really <laughs> busy day to me, um, the only reason why the name is uh, trapped in the girl, yeah, I'm feeling about it is because I was a little girl, and a lot of times when we're young, we go through trials and tribulations, and why are you going through this trial and tribulation? Um, we don't talk about it. You know, like I said, some people end up killing themselves on different levels and stuff. And the reason that my purpose was naming it that because we are a little we are little girls once we were. And then that little girl still pain still stays in us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so you, so you, you were mentioning, um, is that was how, you know, the Lord has blessed you to get through this, and also, um, and we'll talk about forgiveness in a moment, but also being able to do, deal with it day by day. So, um, your thing is that if you didn't have the Lord, you probably would have turned to drugs or even suicide. Is that what you're thinking? Yeah, I, I believe if he wasn't close to me, um, uh, that these things would have happened. I mm-hmm. believe that uh, I could have went a different direction. And uh, we was like Church of God in Christ. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Very familiar with him. Very sanctified. Okay. Uh, okay. So you understand what I'm saying. When I used mm-hmm. to pray all the time, and I used to have these people. In, in fact, they came in my life at the age of 16. Mm-hmm. You know, and and that's what kept my me, you know, comfort. Mm-hmm. Now, um, Ms. Edwards, um, you know, many times, and your story is really familiar, not any different um, in a lot of ways to many other stories, especially when a, a, a mother, you know, lose a husband, a divorce or whatever, and a stepfather comes in and starts off as this really nice guy, but then little do you know he has his eyes on the kids, the daughters and things like that. But the, the greatest travesty is the lack of response or belief from the mother um, I, I, was that your biggest letdown or your biggest? Uh, uh, oh, really? It was. It was. It, it, it was because I was looking at her and actually did, just put him out. You know, that's how I felt because she wasn't doing anything about it, and I was just sick and trim. Like when he would come up in the room and stuff, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, I just didn't. I ran away, you know couple of times, you know, but uh, I ended up back home anyway, you know, regardless. Uh, but um, the, the, I mean, I just, I'm just great. I've always say, I thank God that I'm still alive, because I could have mm-hmm. did something um, mm-hmm. terribly. Because I was around the surrounding not to, mm-hmm. not, not do nothing. It was right there. You know, mm-hmm. I just didn't do anything at that particular time. Now, now, um, what became of your sister? How did she deal with it? 
um, moving into teenage years into adult life? She didn't, she didn't like it. I, but, well, I never brought that up that I was going to do a book because that, was, that wasn't on my mind at that time. What was on my mind was getting out of that house. Mm-hmm. That's all was on my mind. Mm-hmm. So as I grew, you know, I left. I left home at the age of 18. Mm-hmm. Uh, graduated from high school, and I snuck a road letter to my dad, real father. And mm-hmm. then I told him what was going on. Apparently, he got mad. Man, he lived in Chicago. Mm-hmm. And I told him my scholarship. I was gonna get a scholarship for writing journalism. I wanted to be a writer in Chicago. At that time, my mom was saying, uh, "I wasn't gonna do it. They're not gonna hire me as a." Uh, I wanted to be a news reporter. And she said, stop saying that because they're not going to hire you because you're black. And then I felt bad about that. Then my mom, you know, a lot of times they turn on you. You know, they'll say different things. They turn on you. And my mom, she did in her own way. Uh, I love the unconditional, but she did in her own way. Like, she would hit me with her fist and knock me down. Say things, you know, curse it, curse words, three things. I didn't like that because I had no comfort. I didn't have no one to talk to. You really mm-hmm. talk to me like I wanted to talk to. Mm-hmm. And then she would get, uh, she would start offending me when he's hit, when he's there for work. But when he's not, then she's real close to me. So I couldn't mm-hmm. understand that. So I would try to please her. Don't, don't care what I did. I tried to please her. She didn't even talk about graduation. That really hurt it. Oh, wow. That is painful. Wow. Now, yeah, um, everybody, parents, was their stepmind. And I remember now, now my what, call home. Huh? Mm-hmm. Now, what became of your, you and your mom's relationship as you got later on in years? Uh, as I got later on and I moved to Chicago, uh, my dad told us he wanted me to come after he read that letter. Uh, well, I was just really trying to please him, no matter what. Well, even in college, I, I wrote a newspaper, and I sent the newspaper down to her and four of my brothers so they could read it and be proud of it. She said, I said, did you read it? She said, oh, I threw that trash away. I said, she's oh, calling it trash, but that wasn't trash to me. You know, oh stuff like that. She said name the thing like that, and it really offended me. Um, mm. See, some families don't understand. They've never been through it. Mm-hmm. And some families do, you know. But it did used to offend me when she was say. She never gave me credit. Let me put it that way. Mm-hmm. On a lot of things. And um, when she didn't come to my graduation, that really did so when I came, when I graduated from college, I didn't share to her that I was graduation because I didn't want to be disappointed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now is your mom still is your mom still alive? No, she passed away at the age of seventy three. Mm-hmm. Oh wow. Okay. Well, now um, the thing that's very interesting um is that your book implies that in the midst of all the things you've gone through you still were able to forgive your mom as well as your stepfather. Is that correct? That's correct. But now it took um, me a while. It took me mm-hmm. a while. It didn't just take me overnight to do that. Mm-hmm. You know, I just prayed and uh, at, uh, uh, Bishop Noel Jones at that time was my pastor. But now mm-hmm. Bishop, Bishop Charles Blake, and I know you're familiar with him. Mm-hmm. And Jones, uh, but you know, uh, you know. Now you 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 were mentioned in Chicago. I, that's where I was born and raised, actually, um, until I moved out here. To I was born in Cook County. County. Same here. Huh? Now, um, now, same here. I, I was actually born in um, at uh, was Trinity Hospital. Now was in South Chicago back when I was, you know, born. But um, now okay. you live you live out here now, but you were living in Chicago for a good while. Yeah, I live. I've been here for thirty eight years. Mm-hmm. But how uh, long did you live in Chicago? Uh, I was there about eighteen, I would say. Mm-hmm. I would, mm-hmm. 
Uh, let's see. I was 18 when I left, going on 19. And then, uh, no, I was 19 when I left and went to Chicago. And then I stayed to Chicago till I was, I don't know how long I was, probably about 18, I think 17, 18 years mm-hmm. I was there. No, and then um, I came out here. Huh? I'm sorry. Now you and you and then you moved out here to California. I was 29, but I came in December, mm-hmm. and the next month, January, is my birthday just had last Friday. So, for well, happy um, belated birthday to you. <laughs> thank you, sir. And I had it last Friday, and uh, uh, glad to be alive. That's all I gotta say to it all. Yeah, I, I forgave them when I, I got I, I got stronger in the Lord more. And uh, mm-hmm. Bishop No Jones preached about something about forgiveness, and it, it somehow it clicked. Oh, that mm-hmm. sermon, it clicked, mm-hmm. and then uh, I I said I need to forgive my parents mm-hmm. because I was seven. I was. No, I was five when I first came to St. My mom took us to St. Louis from from Chicago to St. Louis. I'm sorry, from Chicago to Mississippi where her mom was. I was three months. And then we left there and then came to St. Louis after he bought our house and everything. We moved to St. Louis. But, um, that's how all this traveling, you know, happened and stuff. But mm-hmm. I learned to forgive through a message that Bishop Jones was preaching about. And uh, he did a part one and he did a part two of it. And uh, I, I, he, it just touched me. I mean, the, 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 the message really touched me. And then he did a part two that next Sunday. And I was just praising God through there. Uh, and he said something about in order to go to heaven, you got to learn how to forgive. Mm-hmm. And I said, oh, man, I got to forgive my stepfather. You know. Amen. And but, you, but, you know, Ms. Edwards, um, the thing that's interesting is that um, I, I'm an ordained minister, and um, I've been, the Lord has blessed me to preach the gospel for many, many years in Bible classes and things since I was like 17 years old. And the two hardest things you'll ever do as a Christian is, I know you know this, is the Bible tell you to love your enemies as your yourself and then to learn how to forgive from the heart. That's very difficult. As a matter of fact, people always say, you know, I'll forgive you, but I won't forget. That's not true forgiveness. Right. Of course, of course right. you'll never forget what someone's done to you that was wrong, but God wants you to live a lifestyle like it never happened because that's what he does for us. So for you to... um you know, have gone through some of the most terrible things that imaginable for a little child to go through with no one to lean on and to be able to find it in yourself to forgive them in the midst of that, that shows a testament of how great God is and how receptive you were to that message you heard. Don't you agree? I agree. You know, I was sitting around thinking about it the other week about how I was kind of had a little wisdom there, you know, Mm -hmm. because I took the letter and wrote the letter in in my uh, study hall because I didn't want no paper trail in my mom's home. If she'd have found the paper trail, she'd have picked it up, read it, and said, what is this about? And then got into automation all over again. So I was smart enough to do that. Mm-hmm. Now, in your book, you speak of triumph. Um, you've become a very successful author as well as a publicist. Now, what do you... What what do you uh, categorize, or why would you what would you say is your barometer to say you've triumphed? Is it because you become a celebrity publicist, an author, or just because you've learned how to forgive? I think forgiveness the most. I think forgiveness helps you to become mm-hmm. a publicist. You know, even when people say that to me, ah, oh, we got to. I said, don't say that. It, it can't as a big cause of the fact that. We're human, just like we all are. Just we got different job positions. Few of us make a little more than the others. That's it, you know. But um, I'm, I'm, I try to stay humble at all times. 
which everybody say I am. And I'm so glad of that, you know. Um, I try to keep that almost spirit even around people that know me or just getting to know me or somebody that said, man, she has a book. Mm-hmm. They don't treat me. They don't treat me different. Treat me the same. Mhm, mhm. You know. Now, well, and I'm grateful. I'm grateful that, you go- that God put me. Well, you know, I wanted. I wasn't trying to be a uh, entertainment uh, writer. I wanted to be a news reporter. I kept saying that, but this is what the rich and God took. Amen. Amen. Now, some who are some of your clients that the Lord has blessed you to be representing to as a publicist? Um, I've worked with Chris Tucker. I rest. I rest. I've I've worked with. Um, Nick Cannon. I worked with um, uh, and for gospel, Kurt. With Kurt, we worked a little bit on projects. That's when Kurt first just came out. Uh, shoot, where is I sitting on? Kurt, uh, when he first got together, started working and everything. He had that fall. Looking back at that time was his. Record label company over there. He where he was over there working with Vicky Matt, Vicky Lata. I can't pronounce, but everybody called her Pick, Vicky Matt. And I worked with her. Uh, some of her clients I worked with. Uh, some of her clients was Trinity Five Seven. Uh, her was the first one, uh, and uh, I had uh, uh, what's his name. Uh, Byron Cage, I worked with somebody else who do her. Um, uh, my first celebrity client that I worked with was C V One. Oh wow. That's a heck of a w that's a heck of a start to getting into the business. My goodness. It could only go it, you started at the beach. Right. You know, I, I that's why I can't well, it, that's how God had that plan. I assume, you know, it's it's uh for me to work it like that. I ran, you know, I, I love conference. I'm a fanatic with conference, so I started going to a lot of conference when I got here. And I ran into a young lady, and the young lady, I didn't know her. Her sister was engaged season one. I didn't know that, and. And so we switched numbers, of course, we talked. And then right after that, I was working for a uh, short time, I would say, at a, at a gospel radio station out here. It was, can't think of the KGLH. I don't know, have you heard of that? I sure I have. KGLH. Okay. And, um, uh, and, and I worked with label companies like Verity Records and all of them, uh, they would when they get their artists here, they would have me to make sure they get into different churches and different things, so that I got to know a lot of record company, and I got to know a lot of uh, you know company for the radio. Um, and you know after after and what happened with Stevie, I, my job went bankrupt. Uh, the radio, you know, when they failed KGLA, and. I was sitting at the house, and this friend of mine called me, this lady we were talking about. And she said, uh, I heard you do promotion, and you do, what do you do? And I told her, she said, my sister is looking for someone to work with her, but she wants, you know, somebody that she can pin on, and the real person, you know, no starstruck or nothing like that. And I said, Oh, no, I'm not like that. I've never been that way. So she said, what, Monday? I'm going to talk to her and Monday. I'm going to have to go down. I go down to the office. Who's sitting at the desk? Stevie Wonder. Mm-hmm. So now I'm saying, what are you doing here? But I didn't know it was coming. So mm-hmm. he's very friendly and jolly. And we laugh, so I laugh. And then I was, my first word, I said, no, I'm not sorry. So I got to Stevie, we need to take a picture before I leave. He said, well, let's take it now. So I took a picture. Well, he said, who are you? Yeah. Well, they told me, and I was supposed to report to someone named Stephen 
Steve Lund Morris. I did not know that was Steve's name. Mm-hmm. So I said, uh, oh, uh, so I'm looking for Mr. Steve Lund Morris and Angela. You know, I said the last name. So she said, uh, he said, you're looking right at Mr. Morris. I said, well, I don't see nobody around here but you. He said, you're looking at it. I said, no, I'm looking at Stephen Wonder. He said, I'm, I'm Stephen Morris. And I said, no, you're Stephen Wonder. And he, we just bigger for a minute, and then he said, that's my government name. So I said, oh, I'm sorry, I apologize. And that's how we kind of got together. And I started going out of town a little bit, working on his foundation. He has two foundations of his. And I worked on one of them. One of them was... Uh, for the kids, he got a blind school that he works with. And then I toured several times uh, with Stevie on the road. Now, to make you a question now, um, Ms. Edwards, so um, what kind of advice um, for all those who are listening and will be listening to this interview? Um, I know you're a bit short on time, and I want to get you get you a rest, but what kind of advice for a young lady or young boy who are getting molested right now and they don't know where to turn. They're they're right where you were many years ago. What kind of advice would you give to help that little? You know, number one, I would say keep God first in their life because you never know who He got to guide you and what direction He got to He would guide. You. I had several people that were kind of guiding me in different directions. Even when I got on the bus at Greyhound, I was crying, and this lady said. I always keep God first, you know, like you get into a church home. You know, she said, you know, when I got relieved, my mom didn't even go with me to the, to the station. My brother took me to the Greyhound station, and I just kissed her. She was laying on the couch and told her I loved her, and I left. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't so, know if she was crying. I didn't see no tears mm-hmm. or nothing. Now, when you left, when you left, a, when you huh? left where were you going? Where were you going? On, where was the Greyhound taking you? To Chicago where my dad lived. Okay. Okay. Because remember what I said it? I sneak and wrote a letter to him? Yeah. Well, he called yes. me my mother. He wanted me to come stay with him for four years. Go to college. But I stayed longer. Mm-hmm. But, Darren, um, where can people buy your book um, and purchase your book? Um, I know I mentioned Amazon and wherever fine books are, are sold. Is there anywhere Born else? Barnes & Noble has it. Okay. All right. Barnes and Noble um, have it, and um, uh, it's Barnes and Noble, um, Amazon. A lot of them buy them on Amazon because they get them in two days. They mail them straight to them in two days. I mean, sometimes in the day they get it. In the day, uh, I I'm gonna have to, you know, uh, I order some. I'm just waiting to look for. They probably at the house now, cause I ordered them, cause I run, I run out. And I'm grateful mm-hmm. that I do run out and everything. Mm-hmm. Even here in the hospital, I could bring ten books with me and sell out, and have to, uh, you know, uh, tell my you know, somebody to come go to my house and bring me my uh, some more books. There about twenty more, you know. But, yeah, you, yeah, but you know your your subject matter. Is very sensitive to many people, whether they want to speak to it about it or not. And you know, um, my thing is, please buy her book. Again, this book is um, something that you definitely want to uh, share, even with your children, because there's a lot of kids out there that um, are getting molested, and no one knows about it. But mothers and fathers need to be aware of what's going on with the terms of that. Again, it's called "Trapped in a Little Girl's Body." It is, excuse me, it is written by uh, yeah. Doreen Edwards. Um, are Dorian. you doing? Are you when you plan to be? Uh, um, when you plan to? Um, the COVID is over and everything. Are you going to do a book tour, autograph signings, and things like that? Well, yeah, yeah I was thinking about that because I've had some invitations for that. Uh, I have been at several churches here, you know. Um, but the, that's what's on my mind of that. But you know, my publisher called me and asked me that I want to do a part two. But what I wanted to do is add an album on it and let some of the singers, like uh, Pamela Mann and a few others, uh, pick a song out that they like uh, to sing 
from that chapter of the book. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I wanted to do that for part two, but I have another book I was thinking about putting together, and I shared it with the publishers. I said the next book mostly going to be about my health. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, um, yeah. my health. I would, not, now, your health. Now, what's going on with your health? Well, you know, I, I had something called, and a lot of people don't know I was going to do a, uh, not a fair, everybody always say fair, but I like conference so that way they can really get certain part of information. Now, um, my health, I, the last six years I've been having a little problem with it. Um, I have something called osteomyelitis. Mm-hmm. Osteomyelitis is a infection. It chews your bone and your body. But you get, most of them get it when they have diabetes. I don't know. Some people might get it other things. But it comes and goes. It don't, you know, it'll never go away. And I've had five back surgery from that. Now, you see me, you might say she don't look like it. But if you check my doctor record, it'll tell you I had, I've had, you know, but my friends, they know. They say, how in the world you... You can get up and walk, you know, that I've had, you know, just collapsed two times over, uh, well, collapsed seven times from having kidney before I started having kidney problems. And then I had uh, two diabetic comas, went through that, you know, and then I've had something called diverticulitis. I've had stuff like that just wearing tearing in my body I've had. Uh, my knee surgery, you know, just one thing after another. And then I had these blisters that came up on my finger. Big, huge blisters, you know, just coming up. They're still working on the fingers right now, uh, just popping up on it. And um, I'm going to, uh, 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 not issue, issue, what is that, uh, that doctor, S I C C U I? No, uh, the college in in, in L.A. Uh, USC? USC? USC. I'm mm-hmm. going there for some of the treatment there now uh, from the fingers. So and there are some things that they don't know about that actually diabetes is terrible. You know how it could bring a lot of attention to people. And we're mm-hmm. going to have Patty LaBelle come out. And and uh, because she had two daughter, two sisters that died of diabetes, both of them died at age forty five, and we're gonna have lunch with Patty Labelle, and uh, we had talked about putting it together and everything. I got sick, you know, again with this osteomyelitis. So uh, right now I'm just taking it one day at a time, you know, and trying to get better and so. stuff. That's why I'm thinking about my book, you know, a lot of other mm-hmm. tragic stuff that happened, you know, towards well, my Ms. body Edwards, and stuff. Well, Ms. Edwards, um, I want to first say a prayer for you. Thank you so much for being on the show. Um, I want to let you get your rest, um, but I'm tell, definitely encourage um, all my audience to purchase the book um, so you can read more about this wonderful lady. She's been through so much, but she's still kicking, staying very positive, and you definitely want to support her as well. And when she's better, um, when you're better, Doreen, uh, I want you to be a guest okay. in the studio. Is that okay? Oh, that would be fine. I really That'd appreciate real that. Fine. In the meantime, you get well. Me. You get well, and we appreciate you being on the show. And on tomorrow's episode of the Sherrard Show, we have a gentleman all the way from Cameroon who's going to be on the Sherrard Show. His dream is to make it to the NBA, but he has to first get through a civil war a civil war that leads him to dodging bullets literally while he's on a basketball court trying to practice for the NBA. This gentleman, Kennedy, is going to be on the Sherrard Show tomorrow. You don't want to miss that episode. And then also um, some of our really big episodes coming up soon. I'm Sherrard. Hope you have a wonderful Saturday. Be safe, be blessed, and we will see you tomorrow. Bye-bye now. Please buy her book. Again, this book is um, something that you definitely want to uh, share, even with your children, because there's a lot of kids out there that um, are getting molested and no one knows about it. But mothers and fathers need to be aware of what's going on with the terms of that. Again, it's called Trapped in a Little Girl's Body. It is, excuse me, it is written by D- Doreen Edwards. So please buy her book.
Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Sherrod Show. If you like additional information about our episodes, you can log on to thesherrodshow.com. You can also check us out on social media, like us on Facebook, look at our YouTube video, subscribe to our newsletter at Essence Television Networks at gmail.com. If you would like to get information to the host, Sherrod, you can email him at thesherrodshow.com. Once again, thank you for joining us and we'll see you next week.